Chapters 3 and 4 of Above Life's Turmoil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Above Life's Turmoil by James Allen. Chapter 3 The Overcoming of Self. Many people have very confused and erroneous ideas concerning the terms the overcoming of self, the eradication of desire, and the annihilation of the personality. Some, particularly the intellectual who are prone to theories, regard it as a metaphysical theory altogether apart from life and conduct, while others conclude that it is the crushing out of all life, energy and action, and the attempt to idolize stagnation and death. These errors and confusions, arising as they do in the minds of individuals, can only be removed by the individuals themselves but perhaps it might make their removal a little less difficult for those who are seeking the truth by presenting the matter in another way. The doctrine of the overcoming or annihilation of self is simplicity itself. Indeed, so simple, practical, and close at hand is it that a child of five whose mind has not yet become clouded with theories, theological schemes, and speculative philosophies would be far more likely to comprehend it than many older people who have lost their hold upon simple and beautiful truths by the adoption of complicated theories. The annihilation of self consists in weeding out and destroying all those elements in the soul which lead to division, strife, suffering, disease, and sorrow. It does not mean the destruction of any good and beautiful and peace-producing quality. For instance, when a man is tempted to irritability or anger, and by a great effort overcomes the selfish tendency, casts it from him, and acts from the spirit of patience and love, in that moment of self-conquest he practices the annihilation of self. Every noble man practices it in part, though he may deny it in his own words, and he who carries out this practice to its completion, eradicating every selfish tendency, until only the divinely beautiful qualities remain. He is said to have annihilated the personality, all the personal elements, and to have arrived at truth. The self which is to be annihilated is composed of the following ten worthless and sorrow-producing elements. Lust, hatred, avarice, self-indulgence, self-seeking, vanity, pride, doubt, dark belief, delusion. It is the total abandonment, the complete annihilation of these ten elements, for they comprise the body of desire. On the other hand, it teaches the cultivation, practice, and preservation of the following ten divine qualities, purity, patience, humility, self-sacrifice, self-reliance, fearlessness, knowledge, wisdom, compassion, love. These comprise the body of truth, and to live entirely in them is to be a doer and knower of the truth, is to be an embodiment of truth. The combination of the ten elements is called self or the personality. The combination of the ten qualities produces what is called truth, the impersonal, the abiding, real, and immortal man. It will thus be seen that it is not the destruction of any noble, true, and enduring quality that is taught, but only the destruction of those things that are ignoble, false, and evanescent. Neither is this overcoming of self the deprivation of gladness, happiness, and joy, but rather it is the constant possession of these things by living in the joy-begetting qualities. It is the abandonment of the lust for enjoyment but not of enjoyment itself, the destruction of the thirst for pleasure, but not of pleasure itself, the annihilation of the selfish longing for love and power and possessions themselves. It is the preservation of all those things which draw and bind men together in unity and concord, and far from idolizing stagnation and death, urges men to the practice of those qualities which lead to the highest, noblest, and most effective and enduring action. He whose actions proceed 
from some or all of the ten elements, wastes his energies upon negations, and does not preserve his soul. But he whose actions proceed from some or all of the ten qualities, he truly and wisely acts, and so preserves his soul. He who lives largely in the ten earthly elements, and who is blind and deaf to the spiritual veridities, will find no attraction in the doctrine of self-surrender, for it will appear to him as the complete extinction of his being. But he who is endeavoring to live in the ten heavenly qualities will see the glory and beauty of the doctrine, and will know it as the foundation of life eternal. He will also see that when men apprehend and practice it, industry, commerce, government, and every worldly activity will be purified, and action, purpose, and intelligence, instead of being destroyed, will be intensified and enlarged, but free from strife and pain. Chapter 4 The Uses of Temptation The soul, in its journey towards perfection, passes through three distinct stages. The first is the animal stage, in which the man is content to live, in the gratification of his senses, unawakened to the knowledge of sin, or of his divine inheritance, and altogether unconscious of the spiritual possibilities within himself. The second is the dual stage, in which the mind is continually oscillating between its animal and divine tendencies, having become awakened to the consciousness of both. It is during this stage that temptation plays its part in the progress of the soul. It is a stage of continual fighting, of falling and rising, of sinning and repenting, for the man, still loving and reluctant to leave the gratifications in which he has so long lived, yet also aspires to the purity and excellence of the spiritual state, and he is continually mortified by an undecided choice. Urged on by the divine life within him, this stage becomes at last one of deep anguish and suffering, and then the soul is ushered into the third stage, that of knowledge, in which the man rises above both sin and temptation, and enters into peace. Temptation, like contentment in sin, is not a lasting condition, as the majority of people suppose. It is a passing phase, an experience through which the soul must pass, but as to whether a man will pass through that condition in this present life, and realize holiness and heavenly rest here and now, will depend entirely upon the strength of his intellectual and spiritual exertions, and upon the intensity and ardor with which he searches for truth. Temptation, with all its attendant torments, can be overcome here and now, but it can only be overcome by knowledge. It is a condition of darkness, or of semi-darkness. The fully enlightened soul is proof against all temptation. When a man fully understands the source, nature, and meaning of temptation, in that hour he will conquer it, and will rest from his long travel. But whilst he remains in ignorance, attention to religious observances, and much praying and reading of scripture, will fail to bring him peace. If a man goes out to conquer an enemy, knowing nothing of his enemy's strength, tactics, or place of ambush, he will not only ignominiously fall, but will speedily fall into the hands of an enemy. He who would overcome his enemy the tempter must discover his stronghold and place of concealment, and must also find out the unguarded gates in his own fortress where his enemy effects so easily an entrance. This necessitates continual meditation, ceaseless watchfulness, and constant and rigid introspection, which lays bare, before the spiritual eyes of the tempted one, the vain and selfish motives of his soul. This is the holy warfare of the saints. It is the fight upon which every soul enters when it awakens out of its long sleep of animal indulgence. Men fail to conquer, and the fight is indefinitely prolonged, because they labor, almost universally, under two delusions. First, that all temptations come from without, and second, that they are tempted because of their goodness. Whilst a man is held in bondage by these two delusions, he will make no progress. When he has shaken them off, 
he will pass on rapidly from victory to victory and will taste of spiritual joy and rest two searching truths must take the place of these two delusions and those truths are first that all temptation comes from within and second that a man is tempted because of the evil that is within him. The idea that God, a devil, evil spirits, or outward objects are the source of temptation must be dispelled. The source and cause of all temptation is in the inward desire, that being purified or eliminated, outward objects and extraneous powers are utterly powerless to move the soul to sin or to temptation. The outward object is merely the occasion of the temptation, never the cause. This is the desire of the one tempted. If the cause existed in the object, all men would be tempted alike. Temptation could never be overcome, and men would be hopelessly doomed to endless torment. But seated, as it is, in his own desires, he has the remedy in his own hands, and can become victorious over all temptation by purifying those desires. A man is tempted because there are within him certain desires or states of mind which he has come to regard as unholy. These desires may lie asleep for a long time, and the man may think that he has gotten rid of them, when suddenly, on the presentation of an outward object, the sleeping desire wakes up and thirsts of immediate gratification. And this is the state of temptation. The good in man is never tempted. Goodness destroys temptation. It is the evil in a man that is aroused and tempted. The measure of a man's temptations is the exact register of his own unholiness. As a man purifies his heart, temptation ceases. For when a certain unlawful desire has been taken out of the heart, the object which formerly appealed to it can no longer do so, but becomes dead and powerless, for there is nothing left in the heart that can respond to it. The honest man cannot be tempted to steal, let the occasion be ever so opportune. The man of purified appetites cannot be tempted to gluttony and drunkenness. Though the viands and wines be the most luscious, he of an enlightened understanding, whose mind is calm in the strength of inward virtue, can never be tempted to anger, irritability, or revenge. And the wiles and charms of the wanton fall upon the purified heart as empty, meaningless shadows. Temptation shows a man just where he is sinful and ignorant, and is a means of urging him on to higher altitudes of knowledge and purity. Without temptation, the soul cannot grow and become strong. There could be no wisdom, no real virtue, and though there would be lethargy and death, there could be no peace and no fullness of life. When temptation is understood and conquered, Perfection is assured, and such perfection may become any man's who is willing to cast every selfish and impure desire by which he is possessed into the sacrificial fire of knowledge. Let men, therefore, search diligently for truth, realizing that whilst they are subject to temptation, they have not comprehended truth and have much to learn. You who are tempted know, then, that ye are tempted of yourselves. For every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lusts, says the Apostle James. You are tempted because you are clinging to the animal within you, and are unwilling to let go, because you are living in the false mortal self, which is ever devoid of all true knowledge, knowing nothing, seeking nothing, but its own immediate gratification, ignorant of every truth and of every divine principle. Clinging to that self, you continually suffer the pains of three separate torments, the torment of desire, the torment of repletion, and the torment of remorse. So flameth Trishna, lust and thirst of things, eager, ye cleave to shadows, dote on dreams. A false self in the midst ye plant, and make a world around which seems, blind to the height beyond, deaf to the sound of sweet airs breathed from far past Indra's sky, dumb to the summons of the true life kept, for him who false puts by. So grow the strifes and lusts which make earth's war, so grieve poor cheated hearts 
and flow salt tears. So wax the passions, envies, angers, hates, so years chase blood-stained years with wild red feet. In that false self lies the germ of every suffering, the blight of every hope, the substance of every grief. When you are ready to give it up, when you are willing to have laid bare before you all its selfishness, impurity, and ignorance, and to confess its darkness to the uttermost, then will you enter upon the life of self-knowledge and self-mastery. You will become conscious of the God within you, of that divine nature which, seeking no gratification, abides in a region of perpetual joy and peace, where suffering cannot come, and where temptation can find no foothold. Establishing yourself day by day, more and more, firmly in that inward divinity, the time will at last come when you will be able to stay with him whom millions worship, few understand, and fewer still follow. The prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. End of chapters 3 and 4 Recording by Andrea Fiore